Okay. Hi everyone, welcome back to Requirements Engineering. Today we'll talk about stakeholders. You've already ha heard that term a few times over the last couple of weeks. And now we're going to dig in in a little more detail. Stakeholders are all the people who have an interest in the system under development. And there are four things that we as requirements engineer are supposed to do with stakeholders. Step number one is identifying them. Now, if we just start from that definition, have an interest in the system under development, that gives you a good idea of where to start. So that interest is by your client, whoever pays, Then there are future user groups. What's the difference in between those? If I'm a user, am I not automatically the client? Huh, no, you don't always pay. So for example, if you think of all your social networks, you don't pay for using them. You're not the client. That means Somebody else gets the benefit, somebody else gets what they want from that system, so they pay for it, you use it, you ha also have some benefits, but you want to keep that other aspect in mind. And you've been around long enough, so you know that you are basically giving away your data. That's your way of paying for social media. And the client is the person who actually pays the developers. So you have the client, you have future user groups. Who else has an interest in the system under development? We can have active and passive interest. So active interest, client, user groups, maybe somebody who needs to maintain that system in the future. like a DevOps team and, sorry, not the DevOps team, they're in development, but part of the DevOps team may become the maintenance team later on. But you also have passive stakeholders and that means they don't care so much about whether your system succeeds. However, they do care about whether you stick to their rules. So this is legislation. whether your system is going to allow to violate any trade laws, for example. So you start with identifying and there is some help out there. There is a bunch of reference lists that will help you identify your stakeholders. So that's the most common way of how we start. And I will present one of those reference lists in the slide set. Second part, analyzing. So you want to classify your stakeholders. Sorry, I mixed it up. <laughs> Analyzing is the third part. <laughs> the second part is classifying. OK, try that again. Classifying. So classifying means you differentiate who has an active interest, who has a passive interest. You identify are they involved with which phase of the project are they involved are they involved only early on during elicitation are they going to be involved during detailed implementation are they going to be involved in later on evolution evolution and maintenance of the system and um, how influential are they So how much weight does their word have? What is their decision competency? 
Third part is analyzing. Now it's good to know all our stakeholders and it's good to understand in what relation they stand to each other. So relations between stakeholders. This is what can often make or break a project because if there is a business unit that wants a system developed but they need all major decisions signed off by a higher boss and that higher boss is unfortunately constantly arguing in uh, weekly meetings with that unit manager, that project is likely going to get in trouble because at some point that guy will just not want to sign off on a specific budget or things like that. So it's good to know, especially if there are conflicts behind the scenes somewhere. That said, it's often hard to, to find out about that. So the best way to go about that is to develop really good personal relationships with your clients and with some of your future users and especially with the decision makers in the project. It is something we tend to underestimate because we like to focus on the solution that we want to develop and do that as good as possible. It's going to be a lot easier if you have good relations with your stakeholders. The other part that we want to do in analyzing is find out what are the primary needs of all those stakeholders. The difficult part about this is that they won't necessarily tell you right up front. Either because they plain don't know what the best or what the true need is, they see a shortcoming in a current system, but they don't necessarily say what their underlying need is. So for example, somebody may state that it's not very helpful that in that system they don't see a time anywhere on the page. But if they're supposed to file away things using that system, for example, take an order, send out bills, things like that, the actual underlying need may be that they need timestamps on those files, not so much that they need to see what time it currently is. Fourth one is managing stakeholders. And that means Again, communicating, making sure they are in the loop. I'm going to make two exclamation marks here because we tend to underestimate that one. It's really, really important to keep your stakeholders in the loop. So you want to go back and send them updates, frequent updates, depending on how often you meet. Say you meet once every two weeks, then you want to send them at least one weekly update in between so they know where they stand. And it's important to keep them in the loop to have their continuous approval. If they feel they are involved and they are important for you, then they will in turn be supportive of what you need from them for being able to deliver the best work product. Sounds simple, but common sense is not always common practice. That's why I stress it so much on this slide. Thank you.